afternoon. Thanks for sticking around. Here to talk a little NoSQL. And my idea of Minibar is like you learn more from the guys in the hallway than you do from guys in the room a lot of the times. Just get people talking. So I looked at the sessions. I was like, man, no one's talking MongoDB. No one's talking NoSQL. So I said, well, I know some people that know that kind of stuff. So I figured I'd get some people together and hear their stories. So part of the panelists, we've got Christian Aestrike. He's actually my cousin. So uh, Christmas family get-togethers, you know, some families talk about turkey. We talk about redis, you know. <laughs> but, you know, that's how it goes. Grandma thinks we're all weird. She's more of a MySQL person, but... <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, he's got some uh, great work with Redis, kind of UHG, but some really cool stuff. He's evaluated MongoDB. And Grant Wood, who I met about six months ago at a, kind of a Scotchtoberfest a mutual friend put on. So we had about 25 bottles of single malt scotch to choose from. And what did we talk about? CouchDB, right? And it turned out okay, right? <laughs> Cool, and we got Dan Johansson, who I met today, and Derek, who I also met today. So I didn't want to stock the panel with people I've known forever. Or just, hey, get some people here. There's smart people here. This is meant to be particip participatory. If you have questions, if you have comments, I want to hear them. We want to hear them. But I want to start by letting everyone kind of give a minute or two description of what they've been doing, kind of in the NoSQL space, just to give you a background of what they're talking about. It's ready to go. Hello. Uh, it, it's on. Yeah, okay. So I'm Christian Aestrike. I work at UHG. Um, recently, in the past year, I've been uh, had an opportunity to be in charge of a lot of these emerging technologies and integration into the healthcare space and the clinical space. So uh, there was a talk that some of you may have been at earlier about using NoSQL in, in healthcare, and we're actually doing some of that research right now, and I'm doing a lot of research into MongoDB. But I also have a background using Redis uh, quite heavily in the company. No external facing apps, but a lot of internal apps just due to the speed and performance and its uh, versatility across all kinds of functionalities that I'll talk about in a minute. So that's my background. I'm Grant Wood. Um, is this, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I have started a number of companies, have done a bunch of um, different things. I've been working most recently with Mongo. I've done a bunch of couch mobile things for my own apps. Um, work with Couch, uh, I'm a serial, nearly used React fan, um, and am interested. Uh, I, I started a company in 2000 that did what would today be called NoSQL, um, but it would be more peer-to-peer -peer NoSQL, um, which isn't something that really exists today, but um, yeah. All right. uh, I'm Dan Johansson. I work at TravelNet Solutions, and we're using uh, MongoDB and uh, kind of a new rewrite of our CMS system that we uh, run our main content website. So we kind of chose it because um, the, 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 the website is really read-heavy workloads, and it's much easier to shard it across multiple uh, data centers than, than it would be with traditional MySQL. Hey, I'm Derek, and uh, I've been actually working with Grant a bit, and I, I work with various companies doing um, fun programming tasks. Um, I've worked with uh, Node.js a lot, and so coming from that kind of JavaScript world, um, it just makes sense to use something like CouchDB. You're saving a JSON object basically as a document. Um, using using a MongoDB, you're saving like a BSON object, so it's, it's pretty much the same thing, you know, binary JSON. So um, I don't know, I, I think it's really cool. I've done a lot of work with um, the traditional LAMP stack, PHP and MySQL. That was kind of like my base starting freelancing, and as soon as I kind of jumped onto the NoSQL thing, it's just been like a revelation for me. I don't know. It's just a lot more fun, and it's it's so much more easy to prototype stuff now, it seems like, anyway. So, um, yep, that's kind of my history and stuff. Pass it down. So when I lead a panel, I ask really hardball questions. Like, so what about Redis makes you happy? I'm going to get on the whiteboard because I haven't seen any whiteboard yet today, so maybe you guys will enjoy this a little bit. But um, one thing that I love about Redis that makes me happy is that it serves a lot of needs 
um, and what we use it for is kind of kind of unique. And uh, anybody here use Redis in, in enterprise? So some some of you guys this this will be like yeah I know I know, but some of you guys will be like aha cool. Anybody uh, Groovy and Grails developer and use Redis? Small amount. Okay, so. I'm not going to try and sell you on Groovy and Grails, but the features I'm talking about are really easy to use through those technologies. You could certainly use them in other technologies as well, um, other platforms, but uh, some of the things I'm talking about make it really easy to integrate. So what we have is we have an application, a uh, traditional app, and it does some stuff, and I'll, I'll try and keep it high level. Um, a traditional NoSQL, we've got some data storage. We want to do some stuff, right? Well, here we've got Redis. Um, that's all fine and dandy. You can persist data. You know, your app can stick data into here. You can put data into your, your Redis database. You've got some data that lives down here. One thing that we really like about Redis is that it's, it's an in-memory database. You know, um, there's a couple different persistence mechanisms with Redis you can, you can enable if you don't want to have it to be destroyed upon every time it goes down or up. You can have like a, a log, a journaling system. You can have, um, also do like a snapshot where it'll, it'll back up your snapshot to disk too so you can also get that uh, restore if you need it. So it's it's pretty it's pretty good for data integrity, but I wouldn't rely on Redis as a truly you know solid uh, data integrity uh, of, of, of in of itself. So what we use it for a lot is applications in which we need uh, to produce some results, uh, statistics, reporting. A lot of apps that do reporting uh, that need to persist data. And that works really great. But a couple other things that we also use it for, um, inside of the app, we have content we display to users. And we've got some HTML page you know, in our app that has some segments that produce some you know, fairly complicated things to uh, render. Maybe it's complex data uh, analytics that are graphed or what ends up being happening. We end up taking these results. And not only are, are, is there data that's persisted here that are you know, person objects, your place objects, et cetera, et cetera. Um, our drivers with Grails here allow us to memoize that content, and I'll, I'm just going to output framework. So we, we can memoize this data, and then we get, we get these objects in memory as well. Now we've got page content caching that Redis is also doing. It's persisting our data. It's doing content caching on the page. So when this page loads back up, we get, boom, it's instantaneous. It comes back up right away. It's in memory. Oh, and we also want to do some message-driven uh, stuff. Well, we could use MQ, we could use JMS, all that stuff is really great, but why not just use Redis? It's already there and it's available, it's in memory. So there's some frameworks within Grails, um, and JustQ is what it's called, and that allows us to basically have this queues, and the app can then queue up into this queues, and it actually uses Redis as the back end. So now we've got an MQ system, we've got data persistence through, you know, a database layer, and we've got caching all going into Redis. Um, so, the, so the point is that we, we can use this one implementation of Redis, and if we want to have it, you know, if you want to have multiple instances here, you could certainly do this. Um, and what I really like about it is that it serves a lot of needs in our in our particular enterprise space here. So we. I, I use this a lot as a, as a data backer because it's so lightning fast. You know, I could spin up my SQL. We could use some Oracle instances that we have, but you know, getting procurement for those from the enterprise team is like pulling teeth at our, our company. So, you know, I can fire this up and I can use this on my, on my servers in about two minutes. I download it, fire it up, it's done. So, that's what's really great about Redis too. It it, it runs really fast. Um, its overhead is really low when it boots up. I mean, I think it uses like 400k. I mean, worth of memory usage is really low. And then as you start streaming stuff into it, its memory footprint goes up and up and up. But So it serves a lot of these different needs all with one implementation. So it's, it's great for us. It uh, does a lot of things. So any questions on that? Yes. Is the answer, but you know, we haven't had the need to really do any kind of clustering with Redis right. yet. Yeah, but right. So I think the answer is that it does have that concept. There's there's a Reddit clustering support um, across here, and the, 
There's a couple different ways to set it up, and I, I'm not probably the best to speak to that, but I can tell you that from what I've seen, through like white papers and reading a lot of documentation on their website, um, you, can have, you can have clusters, you can have distributed data, so you can have clusters of Redis where you've got, you know, let's say you have data spread across here, you could have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You can have all these different data elements spread across these multiple nodes. Um, you can do backups to these nodes. So these nodes can have, you can have master and slaves, you know, so then we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And these actually talk to each other. Um, a ping and a pong. There's a lot, there's a, there's a kind of a act and an act back. So they, they will keep track of instances and, and if they're up or they're down. Um, and you can, you know, and you can configure the servers to basically time out other servers to like, hey, you didn't, you didn't give me an acknowledgement back. So there, there is capability to set up this clustering within Redis. Again, our needs haven't been that great, so, but it certainly does support it from what I've seen, so. Not months. Um, you know, typically, we, we don't use Redis as a long-term persistent data store. We use it as more of a short-term persistent data store. So, you know, this, the kind of things that we're doing to our application and this particular app I'm talking about, we're doing a lot of performance metrics, uh, data analysis. So we, we only have to hold the data as long as we want to deliver it to the management team. So usually it's a week or two that it persists in there. So never months worth of data. But, you know, I haven't had any stability problems. And we're running on a Windows, uh, server, you know, a Windows, uh, I don't know, it's a box, it's a 32-bit Windows server, so it's JVM uh, 1.6, so, yeah, I don't, it's, it's been good. Cool. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, if you, if you wanted to have that persisted disk, there's a couple different configuration options in Redis to set up. Um, you can have it, like I said, journal, so you could have the, you could recreate your Redis instance if it were to crash. Uh, so for, for, pers for persistence, it would be. Grant, you want to tell us what, about CouchDB, MongoDB, sure. uh, so how, many, how many people here have used Couch or Mongo? Couch, Mongo. How many have used Couch? How many Mongo? Okay. So, um, so there's kind of interesting differences between the different flavors of NoSQL. They're all kind of converging. They're all trying to solve the same problem. So they've all come from different backgrounds, but they're all ending up in the same place. So after the next couple of years, we'll either see them all kind of consolidate together or they're going to have the, the nuances are basically going to be probably what cloud you're going to deploy them into um, or how you're going to deploy them into your own cloud. So <clears throat> I'm not sure what everybody wants to learn about, but I can tell you one experience that I've had. Uh, working with Couch in particular. So Couch uh, is really appealing to me for a couple of reasons. Um, and it's evolving in a way that's interesting, but maybe not as appealing to me as the, as the old way was. So Couch is cool because uh, as a document store, take your JSON document. If you're not familiar with document stores, you can take a JSON document, you put it in the store, it stores it. it you now have an ID in that document, and you can do interesting things with that ID, like request that document back. Ooh, cool. But then you can have all of your documents in that store and you can run a function against them. So we were talking about Node with Derek a little bit earlier. Uh, for Couch, you write functions in JavaScript. Couch itself is written in Erlang and there's a little in-between layer that lets you take and run a, a MapReduce function, which takes that particular function and iterates through every single document in the database and applies that function to it. The only purpose of that function is to emit a key and a value based on the document that you give it. There's some interesting things you can do with just that. And one of them is you can emit more than one key and more than one value each time the function sees a particular document. You can then do what they call the reduce uh, part of this. And what you do there is you get the results of your emit, the keys and the values. And you basically, the most simple example is you count them. You, you, r you run a tally. So for instance, I can go in and I can write a simple little JavaScript function in Couch and I can run it as a map reduce and I can say, Go into this document, uh, document store, find every document where there's a first name value of Grant, and count them. Okay, great. So it'll go through and it'll come back with a number. Uh, and it does this pretty fast. Um, Couch's current benchmarks on their thing are 100 millisecond return iterating over four petabytes of data stored across their B trees, which is crazy fast. Uh, so that's, uh, that's for lookup now. Once you start doing more and more in your 
in your maps, um, this starts to slow down considerably. Um, Couch on its own uses a, a B tree uh, mechanism that's redundant and resilient onto the disk. They try and keep everything in memory. So when you're doing requests, they try and keep absolutely everything in memory as much as possible. But everything is written back out to the disk in a way where, uh, if anyone's familiar with NetApp filers, they do something similar where they, they do end writing. So when you do a write, they take your brand new document or an updated document, they write it to the end of the file, and then they take the index and they write it right after that file. And there's a mechanism for doing that. So that if you lose power in the middle of that write, they can actually recover from it if the document was written but the index wasn't rewritten. So as it starts up, it'll say what's at the end. If it's not an index, then roll back and see what was the last thing that was successfully written, and then roll forward from the old index. So you've got some power there in terms of just some stability. Um, now, that's all cool on its own, just as a way of dealing with documents and doing MapReduce. And you'll hear a lot about that if you go and read any of the Google white papers on how MapReduce is really cool. Um, but beyond that, there's a really interesting feature in that uh, you can set up really quick clusters of um, couches. And you can basically log into a couch and say, hey, here's the address of another couch. Replica everything that he has in it. And he'll go over and he'll ask the other couch and he'll copy absolutely everything that's in it. You can also say replica that continuously. So it'll go grab every document and every subsequent update. So as they're happening, uh, it'll grab it. Now the way it does that is what's really interesting for programmers because you can actually have your app go and listen also for changes. So you can say, I want to watch the change log, essentially, on this database. And so you can sit there and watch everything happening, and you can you know, fire off events based on certain things happening. So if you wanted, you could write basically a little sniffer on database updates, and, uh, which is something that I've done in the past looking for errors. I'm looking for a particular condition. I just sit and I listen for the change log, and I grep through looking for whatever it is I want. Um, now, there's another interesting part about this is all you're doing is you send an HTTP request to one of your couches and it just starts replica, re replica uh, setting itself, okay? But it's a really informal contract. It's simply a connection between one box and another box. So if anyone in the area has worked on really big SQL systems in, in really big companies, just about the last thing you're going to be able to do when you want is, can I have a copy of that data? Um, it, really aggressive companies that do something where a team will get a box somewhere and every night they'll dump the production database onto that box. And so every day you get a brand new thing. And that's great, but you kind of lose your work every day <laughs> in that one box. And, and that's not really all that great. With something like Couch, uh, if you've decided to go with a document store this way, one of the really cool things with this replica auto is that at any given time you can just make your own copy of the data. And you've got it and you can do whatever you want. More interesting is that when you make that copy, you can give it a filter. And you can say, I only want this set of copies. So using the same mechanism as a map reduce, you can reduce out data, and you can only grab the subset that you want. Now, think about, uh, I don't know if anybody was at some of the healthcare things that were earlier today, but they're talking about the problems of HEPA security and how do I give someone a view of something. So just at the crudest level, I bet anybody in this room could write the following system. Someone logs in, gets a credential. We look up that credential, we figure out what they're able to see, we basically build a map reduce. We go to the database, we ask for a copy of the data that matches everything that they're allowed to see. Now they have their own copy. Now they're, now they're the owner of it. It could live in your system, it could live in their system, it could live absolutely anywhere. Um, and you could even sign everything so you know where they got it and you know, all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, there's no possible way that data could leak out of that because you've, you've got a nice copy. Oh, and by the way, you can set up a continuous replica on that so that that data set is always being updated. Um, this is really useful for other things too, uh, which is what another thing that makes Couch interesting in that you can set up continuous replication so that you can run your queries your, for your reports off one. You can be dumping data in it from, into another one. Um, you can slice and dice the data a million different ways uh, with Couch. Now, Couch 2.0, they're changing things and they're making it a little more admin friendly, which is more what Mongo people are used to. So in Mongo, uh, if you want to have two things that have the same thing, you create what's called a replica set. You publish a document into Mongo. And you say, here you go, and it has a replica set ID, and it basically goes out and it talks to the machine addresses that you gave it, and it says, hey, I want you to join up, and they say, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to join up. Okay, I, I'm in the same one as you. And now we start sharing data across those Mongos. And you can report on one, and you can do, so you can run it the exact same way. But from an administration standpoint, it's a little bit more what people are used to when they're talking about running a cluster. Uh, couch 2, Couch Base, I should say, Couch Base 2.0 is headed in that direction now where they basically do something kind of like Redis where you have a, or no, I'm sorry, not Redis, React, where you have a hash ring 
uh, you can join up volumes and remove volumes, and there's a little client side thing that basically determines which member of the ring that you want to talk to to get the piece of data that you want. Uh, again, they do that so that they keep everything in memory, so everything's really fast for retrieving. They also do incremental updates. Uh, so basically, you, uh, um, this is Couchbase 2.0 now, not Mongo, but basically you can run a MapReduce. The MapReduce will get sent out to all the different machines. Uh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't move this farther away, I guess. Um, it'll send your MapReduce to each individual machine that has the individual piece of data. It'll run across each individual machine. It'll run all the results back to the proxy, which will uh, basically sort them for you, put them all back together, and return them. And the putting back together is inconsequential in time, is how they describe it, essentially. Um, so you can think about that as linear scalability. They call it elastic scalability. So as you need more power to spread things out across more machines, handle more reporting, handle more users, whatever, you can just add in more nodes and it will automatically figure out how to move the data around in a smart way and you can still do your map reduces across them uh, using the horsepower of all those different machines, uh, which is kind of cool. So I started working on this with uh, Couch Mobile and maybe I'll pass on the mic and then I can talk about Couch, um, doing mobile stuff with Couch. So. So Dan, you can, talk, you can answer the same question, what makes you happy, or you can talk about like what misconceptions you had going in doing kind of NoCl SQL stuff. Uh, okay, so your choice. For the most part, I'm uh, I'm just using Mongo for our application and using it in a PHP application with Zen Framework and Doctor and ODM. Um, I kind of did a lot of research before using anything, so I kind of had an idea what 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 to expect, but. Um, there were some things that you have to kind of think about a lot differently coming from MySQL than you do when you're using NoSQL. Um, and there are some things that end up being easier, especially if you're dealing with hierarchies of documents or hierarchies of trees and that sort of thing. Like with the hierarchy, you can just create a set of all the parents of that, that, are, that are above that particular node, with where in MySQL you have to do some other tricks and it's kind of a, a fun way to get there. Um, that, but the, some of the other things that you have to be aware of is even in NoSQL, you may still have relationships between different objects. And in some cases, you have to sort of, if you can't guarantee that that relation is always going to be there, you have to denormalize some of the data that you might need in this other object. So you have to kind of keep that in mind all the time when you're developing these different objects. And some of the, what I'm using, uh, Doctrine ODM, which kind of uh, helps create the, between PHP objects and, and the, the Mongo just kind of makes it more one-to-one, -one, which if you're using traditional MySQL, you couldn't do it all. So <laughs> that saves a lot of time in, in developing models and, and all that. So. so I think I'm just going to talk a little bit about my experience with the difference between SQL and NoSQL general concepts. My background is building, doing PHP and doing MySQL basically and building like content management systems and you have a lot of relationships between your different models that you're defining in your database and they're, they're basically defined in such a way that you can do one string, one call, one kind of SQL query and it will return everything for you in one kind of clump and so the, the way that you kind of want to architect your data is you want to normalize all of your data so that it's very distinct sections and nothing is like, you're not embedding too much information in one table so you can kind of, that's, that's kind of how you deal with MySQL like performance stuff I think, but I don't know, and also maybe, does this sound useful like talking about this to anyone or? Okay, okay, cool. So with MySQL, you know, you have a, user table, you give it an ID, you'll give it a name, uh, you know, bio. So, okay, you have that one, one table in MySQL, that's cool, you can query on it, say, you know, find by ID user table or whatever, or find all from user table. Well, now you want to attach a profile to it, so maybe bio, you don't want to put too much in there, so you're thinking, okay, maybe I want to store this in another document, another table called uh, user profile. So in here we'll, we'll, we'll change our data model. Now we have a, uh, well first we'll have this, this will have an ID, this will have um, all sorts of, you know, cool stuff like age, 
location, uh, et cetera. So now, how do we get these two documents from one call? So in MySQL, you would, you'd have to set up a data relationship. You would say, okay, you could, you could do it a number of ways, obviously, but you could do like a profile ID. So now this profile ID points to here, right? I mean, this is all basic kind of data modeling stuff. So this is, this is kind of the SQL kind of approach. So the no SQL approach to this is really denormalize de your data, which is everything kind of goes in here. It's a, we have this JSON object called user. We got the ID, we have the name. And now we want to have like a profile. So profile could just be the key and inside that you have all sorts of stuff. So you can have nested objects, obviously, with a, with a JSON object. So this is kind of the cool thing with uh, NoSQL stuff and JSON document stores in general is embedded, you, you kind of embed everything in. So this is, this is what they call a document database, a document store. So the idea is, you know, this, this becomes your document that has everything else. You'd have your age, location, et cetera. So here it's one query because you basically just say, give me the user with this ID, and then you can check you have everything in it. Um, so those are kind of, that's like super rudimentary basic differences between a document store and a, and a SQL thing. Um, So you have a, a list of teachers. Am I getting this right? You have a list of teachers and a list of classes, and you want to know what do you? I, I assume you would probably put the teacher Well, The answer is there's many, many ways to do that. So um, this is one of the things that's very different that fits right in with uh, what Derek's talking about. So in a database, you create different tables for everything, and that's your schema. In a NoSQL document uh, store, you can put many, many, many kinds of various documents in the same exact database. Um, most databases allow you to segment out the parts of your database into arbitrary buckets. So like Couch has buckets, and Mongo has collections. They're they're analogous. Uh, React has buckets as well. Um, so you can basically say, I'm going to create a database. The database is an instance, an address space, and then uh, you get a namespace, which is the number of buckets, and then usually in that namespace is also indexes. So you get 24,000 indexes in a couch. Um, so what you can do is you can create a collection, and you would put something, you'd create a class uh, document. In the class document, if I were doing it, I'd create a, a teacher document, had all the information in the teacher, I'd create a student document that had a bio of a student, um, whatever, and then I would create something called a class document. And in the class document, I would put the ID of the teacher document on, on a teacher property, and I'd put an array of, uh, I mean, there's a lot of different ways of doing it, but a, a really crude way of doing it is to put an array of IDs back to each of the students that are in the class. Um, and now you've got this thing called a class. And in that same document, you can have the time of day that the class is, you know, the schedule, um, even the subject, whatever. But now that class has a unique ID. So then you could also create something like syllabus objects, right? Which might be uh, every day you have an assignment. You throw them into the exact same store. Now what's interesting about that is if you want to find out every single thing that has a relationship to a class, then you can go in and you can map and you can look for uh, various properties that have the ID pointing back to whatever. So if I knew that I had class, uh, uh, class object um, and I want to find all the teachers um, for a particular class, well, again, teacher's not a good one. I want to do like a reverse lookup. So, oh, that, yeah, perfect example. So, yeah, you want to find all the tech classes for a teacher. You just reduce uh, through looking for, uh, there's, well, two ways of doing it. One, the first is the crude way, and you'd go through and you'd look for 
teacher, and then you'd give it the value of the key that you wanted, and it would give you back a list of all of the all of the classes that were pointing to that particular teacher ID in that particular property. Okay. The other thing, though, that uh, happens all the time with this, and Derek and I have been doing this this week, is when you create documents, um, you have to. If you think about documents more the way you think about objects in an OO programming language, that can help, although you kind of can get into some traps with that. Um, you can start putting too much information in your documents, so you're denormalizing your data, but you don't need to, to you don't need to put the kitchen sink in there. Um, but what you typically do, and what's a, kind of a common practice, is you throw in something like a, uh, a type property on every document so you can type them. So you can say, I only want to, you want you to return things that are class objects and match these other criteria. Um, that way you can go in and get all your classes, and you can go in and get all your teachers, and you can go in and get all your students or whatever. Uh, it, yeah, so MapReduce is a, an N1 operation. N is the number of documents in your collection. So this is a number that's important when you start deciding how many documents you want to have in your particular collection. So your collection is going to be the scope on which you do a find operation or you do a map reduce operation. A find is essentially the same thing. Uh, like in Mongo, you can go on the console and you can type find and you give it a JSON document basically that has a property and a key and a property and a key uh, or a key and a value and a key and a value and it'll find anything that has those key and values and it'll add them into your uh, result set. So one thing that's cool is you can actually treat it really like similar to how you do things in SQL. Um, you can you can just have like like your user and like if, if you just create every document, there's they're not in their own tables, they're all in the same kind of space or bucket, but they have a type. This is what Grant, um, Grant was talking about. They have a type so that you can search on and and you can you can use that almost as it's like a table. So like and this that's just like an arbitrary thing that you could create, but you attach like a classes to your user. You have this user document and now it has a classes. So if this user was a teacher, so per, perchance as the teacher uh, like kind of record we're, we're talking about here, you know, you have you have classes which is just an array of IDs that point to a class type. So that's kind of one way you can basically do it. So I mean, there's things that are different, like, and there's things that are similar. The real the real win with with uh, document stores versus kind of table stores is for prototyping. So this is good for like startup situations where you know you go in one day and you've kind of brilliantly architected this whole structure for your database and you start building all code on top of that and it's really, with, with MySQL it's kind of fragile in a sense. You're creating all these test documents and running all these tests and like, you're, it, it's, it's more of an issue I guess when you're in production scenario but the idea is with prototyping is like your, your business requirements change so fast in a startup. You, you have one thing you have to do this week, next week it's like, oh, flip that on its head, we have to add all this and that and change this around and so with like NoSQL you can just, it's just like you just you, you just do it, you change it, you know, you change your document model before you save it. With a with a MySQL approach, you kind of have to like consider what you've already built and what's going to break if I start adding in new stuff. And you have to go back and change a lot of your code instead of just changing your your data model in a sense. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, there's a big win in in prototyping scenarios with with something like CouchDB, but then there's also You, um, so typically what you do, there's, I, I looked for last night and to try and prepare for today. There's a really cool thing in Mongo. So SQL database, you're probably used to SQL scripts and when you start up an instance, it'll fire off all your scripts and so it'll make any updates that you've made uh, to, your, to your tables. So there's a tool like that from Mongo and I can't recall the name of it. I looked for it. And basically what they do is they create a collection in Mongo. You put JSON, uh, oh, I'm sorry, not JSON, you put JavaScript in there and the JavaScripts have uh, uh, your, your conversion tools. So you basically just write code that iterates through all the documents of a type or every single document in your, uh, in your collection and you update the document, you change it just like you'd change JSON that you were manipulating in a web page or you'd be manipulating anywhere else. So it's a JSON object, you can do anything to it. So a, uh, a common one is uh, you put date and time stamps in something, right? Well, 
What if you need another kind of time information in, in addition to create date and last updated? You want to put something else like, I don't know, last time supervisor modified it or you know, just making something up. So what you'd do is you'd create something um, that would iterate through, look for all the documents that you wanted to add that field to, and you'd update the JSON document and you'd save it on, in place. When you save a document in here, this is something we haven't really talked about yet. Um, so SQL, you've got a unique key that you have to have in a row that makes it unique against everything else. These document stores do the same thing, but they do it in a different way. Instead of giving you some sort of incrementing key that means something in a table, they generate a random, uh, well, I should say semi-random UUID for every single document. So every single document that goes in here gets a brand new UUID. Typically, um, Mongo and Couch do it the same way. You get this property gets added into every single document that you add. You can set your own value on that. But anytime you use the same value as another document has, you're going to replace the document. So if you're creating a new document, you don't put ID on there, it'll create it for you. If you're creating a document and you do put it on there, it'll be a creator update. So if it exists, it'll o overwrite it. If it doesn't exist, whatever. Um, so that's how you grab out a document and then you save it back. And so it knows you're updating the document based on this. So there is still maintenance to change your schema. You, you will still have to do that. But if you do MapReduce, so here, here's the consequence of not updating. This is kind of the other kind of interesting bit. If I go through and I add in my supervisor date property into something, um, I might add it to all those documents, but I don't actually have a date to put in there that's important to my business case, right? Because I haven't done it yet, but I've added in that property, so it's empty. It's just, it's in there, right? So if I have now updated my scheme and I don't go and add that, when you map through or you do a find, anything that doesn't have that property, if you're looking for a value on that property, it simply won't return, which is correct because it doesn't have that property. The same way if you search for classes across a collection that has students and teachers in it, it'll only return you teachers that have classes, but it ignores all the other documents because they don't have that property in it. I don't know if that helps or if that confuses the situation. Yeah. Yes. In my situation, we can't go back and make all of our data stop. Right. We have to do it because we need to make it back to the collection of jobs that we don't need to do it. Yep. Yeah, I, I've likened it to log files. You, if you update your. If you update uh, oh, yeah, a, a web server version and, it, and your web server is now going to start outputting new log files, you're not going to go back through your old log files and add imaginary data in just so you have the same fields in there. Uh, you might have to change how your grep works <laughs> when you're pouring through your log files back beyond a certain date. But, you know, it, it's just something you have to be aware of more than anything. You can't invent historical data. And that's where a majority of your data going into one of these things comes from. Think of it as log files. Now, that's not always the case. There is application-specific documents that you can put in uh, systems like these uh, that aren't getting generated on the same uh, level that log files are. That doesn't mean you don't have big data. It just means you have different data. And if you need to go back and add stuff, you can do it. And these systems are really well suited towards really big, long projects. It's just don't expect it to happen today. You know, you could. You can run something literally for a month across 100 servers, and, and by the time it's done, you've updated everything. Uh, and you've been using it in the meantime. Um, so, With uh, SQL, if you're looking for its data integrity and transactional integrity and all that stuff, you definitely better be using SQL because most of the NoSQL ideas are built on kind of the concept of eventually consistent, which means that it'll eventually, across all the nodes, will be correct data. You can do transactions on NoSQL, but a two-phase commit, say, in a, in a SQL database, it's still right in there. You've got to have pretty much any flavor of SQL you can have today. Uh, the couch example. Give it like 12 to 20 steps, depending on how you're going to do it, of updating different things. So yeah, you can do it. It's just maybe it's not the best tool to do that. There's 
is another sort of scenario, and it, it kind of depends on what sort of uh, use case you have and what kind of data that you have and how you're using it. Um, NoSQL works best if you're kind of taking the approach of, well, I need data to look like this when I'm using it in my application. It's not as flexible when you need to do ad hoc reporting, joining a bunch of different tables together, building reports, that sort of thing. It, it can be done, but it's, it's, you've got to go through MapReduce and some other processes to get there. Um, whereas in MySQL, you can write a quick query with a bunch of joins or whatever you needed to do to pull it together and, and get it out there. That's a really good, that's a really good point. Um, you have to think differently about your data with a document store. And in fact, uh, one of the projects I'm working on right now, we're actually looking at incorporating Redis on top of Mongo, uh, Mongo right now. Um, and part of it is for performance reasons. So there's some ad hocness to some of the things that we can do in the store that we can generate the data really, really well and really, really easy in Mongo. It's just it takes maybe three minutes to run. And for an end user using this one thing with an animated little JavaScript pie chart and whatever, it's not so good to sit for three minutes and wait for that data to run. So to make that thing snappy, there's a couple things we can do. You can set the user expectation that your data is going to be instant, but it's 15 minutes old. And we can just run batch jobs all day long, literally like cron jobs with scripts right from the console um, that just run and run these reports and it reduces everything down into a little summary pages. So if you want logs, well, it's really easy for me to reduce out last month's logs and map reduce it down into a little tally number. That's what map reduce is at. So I can actually create a separate collection and just be churning through all my production data for the last hour. And at the end of the hour, I run it hourly or 15 minutes or whatever you want to do it and do these things. Now, it's actually much faster than to run you your annual report across 12 documents because I've rolled it into monthly roll-up reports. And then you can do other cool things too where you can roll up dailies, you can roll up monthlies, you can roll up hourly to throw them into those documents. Um, and that way, if someone wants their yearly view, you just grab 12 documents, aggregate them together in your client, in your web browser or your native client or whatever you're doing, and now you've got that really fast report. But you didn't have to pound away on the server in order to do it because you use it in the data. But if you want to drill down into the data, great, I can drill you down into the day. Oh, you want to see what was just happening? Okay, great. Now I'm going to set some expectations on how real time I can make this. So part of it is just simply understanding the limitations of the tool and then discovering what your appetite is for how many EC2 instances or how many boxes you want to have running on the server. How much do you want to pay for SSDs? You know, um, SSDs, really big performance advantage. <laughs> uh, this is really what they're good at, this massive dot, uh, train. Memory is better though. Memory is <laughs> way better. So that's what we're looking at using Redis for. Because I can stand up those reports and keep something incremental, and I don't care if it goes away or if it dies or Amazon has an outage because I can re-reduce all those things and rebuild those things in memory. The biggest reason we chose to look at Mongo in our stack is we've already got two terabytes of data stored. And we're looking at, you know, as the data grows, especially years, in the next four years, we're talking like 10, 20 terabytes of data, and then trying to sift through that stuff is going to be a nightmare. So we're looking at Mongo and how we can aggregate those large volumes of data. Merkle, I don't know if it's going to scale to a petabyte or a terabyte. And a cool use case that I've heard uh, somewhere in UHD they're doing this. I can't talk about it, I don't know if you can. So <laughs> you're talking about where is SQL good? SQL's great at ad hoc queries. Well, guess what, what a great way to make SQL tables is. <laughs> you can run MapReduce and you can transform all that data coming out and throw it into a table. And you can do it every hour. You can do it every, you know, you can be constantly updating those tables so that they're accurate within an hour the same way as your other reports are. But now you've got it in an ad hoc system that's really fast and really well understood. And by the way, it can scale really big, too. I mean, call up Amazon, go get yourself an RDS one, and you can throw a whole crap load of SQL tables in there. Okay, we've so got about one more minute. <laughs> Christian, do you have, we've heard a lot about the document databases. Do you have anything to say for the key value stores? <laughs>
Cool. That's about the time we have. Uh, we should keep talking, but there might be beers involved. I don't know. Stick around. We should keep uh, talking, but it's been a long day. Thanks for coming out. I uh, hope you guys learned some stuff. Give a hand.